Welcome back to Terrible Fishing. Oh, have we got a great show for you today. Well, let me just, t let's start off with a little bit of a fishing. It, with the heat, the heat warms up water and it is hot out there. We are in the middle of a heat wave and it's been just kicking on top water. So if you like to catch bass on the top water, try a whopper plopper or try a wake bait or something like that. A spook, anything you want. And just let that thing run on the top of the water and just watch the show. The panfish are just hitting too. You could pick just about any lake you want, whether it be Agate, Emigrants, Lake of the Woods, Heights, House Prairie, it doesn't matter. Willow Lake, it just doesn't matter anymore. Just go with a small little jig and, and toss it in there. You could swim it. You can use a bobber on it. Do whatever you want. As you, far as the uh, rainbow trout, they've gone deep 20, 20 to 30 feet down. So you're going to have to use a sinker in order to get that bait down to the bottom. And about a five-foot leader with some power bait, you will have a great time pulling in as many rainbow trouts as you want. Remember, your limit is five. So, you know pick wisely. Now, let's get on with our show. All right, welcome back to Terrible at Fishing. Ken and I are going to talk to, we're going to bounce around some ideas on reels. What do we like? Some reels I, I have probably used once in my life. And uh, spinning reels, bait casting reels. So, Ken, on in. <laughs> help me out. What What do you enjoy? You just showed me a, a, a an open reel. I don't know anything about open reels besides the antiques that I got. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, I guess that's for the old timey trolling type stuff. Doesn't it? it doesn't have much of a place in in modern gear anymore where you have to kind of lay the line on. I, I think like the tuna guys use those sometimes where they're worried about the friction from, from, you know, the mechanism that lays the line on the spool. But I don't, I don't see them used any, any other time. I used to have a little one for ice fishing that came in kind of handy. They're very heavy. And that that's probably why I don't, I've never even put it on a rod because I'm casting all day long and I, I'm out there 10 to 12 hours. And so lightweight is really, really, really important for me. And, you know, as, as cool as this, my flugers are, I have a rocket and I have a Trump. And I think that was named well before Donald Trump. Um, Cause it was like 1930s, you know, <laughs> that, that one came out. So Trump wasn't a big thing, but evidently um, Fluger had a Trump reel. And uh, so I've got, these and but they're so heavy this thing got it's got to weigh a pound <laughs> i mean this is pretty heavy and i i just couldn't i couldn't fish with this on my boat unless it was you know in a rod holder yeah for trolls you know, yeah oh. or or even deep sea you know i mean i could see i could see me you know down jigging this you know on a, on a boat you know deep sea maybe doing some rock fish or or uh, yeah. some ling cod or something like that. I could see that being used for that. But I mean, it's a good looking reel. I mean, I keep I keep them in good shape. So my my trump's got a cork, um, um, you know what do you call it? The spindle is cork, mm. so mm. it just holds onto the line. Mm. And I don't do that anymore. But it's kind of cool actually. It's really old. <laughs> They're not worth much, by the way. You know, these old flugers, I mean, 20 to 40 bucks, you know, well, used. Why do we online. still hold on to them then? Why do I got 15 of those things in my desk over there? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know. Because they're cool looking. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nobody I mean, else wants just, them. <laughs> I mean, and even even tells you where to put the oil. You know, you open this up, put the oil in it. So, I mean, it's just like a dummy's, you know, dummy proof. This is a pretty easy reel to own. Um, but that's not what we fish with. Not usually, you know, so what's your favorite reel? Well, I guess it depends on how I've been fishing. I think for me between a spin reel and a bait casting reel, it's 
which arm gets tired. You know, yeah. like a lot of folks will buy the uh, right-handed bait casters, you know, and so they're, or left-handed, I'm sorry. So they're using their same hand, whether they're spin casting or bait casting. But I've found that being able to switch back and forth, depending on which arm is fatigued, will uh, decide which one I want to use that day. I always like to uh, catch fish with a with a open face reel, you know, with and the the inline reels. Of course, they're better for bigger fish and uh, hold heavier line, eat more easily than you can't put thirty pound test on a spinning rod and expect it to stay on there, you know, without jumping off while you're casting. So there's some kind of nuts and bolts stuff that comes down to the decision. But in my mind, you know, I'm going to fish with a spinning rod, uh, most times, but if my arm starts getting tired, I'm, I'm going to switch over to that bait caster. And even if I'm trick fishing, you can, there's some techniques, you know, that come into play there. So yeah, my favorite rod depends on the day, I guess. So, I mean, I remember when I first started full-time fishing, um, my next day, my wrist would be so tired. I almost felt like I had carpal tunnel because it just it just hurt. And so at that point, I knew, okay, you know, my spinning rod, reel was too too big. And why do I need a 3,000? I mean, most people do not need a, you know, for me anyway, this is my opinion, need a 3,000. So a 2,000, when I, when I went to the smaller one, because I don't need... 200 yards of line on my reel spool. I just don't. I mean, I don't cast that far for one. And well, it just seems a little silly for me. And when I when I downgraded from a um a 3000 to a 2000 that helped. And then, you know, I you know, here's a here's an old Shimano, but it's all metal. <laughs> I mean, this is a this is a really nice Shimano, but it's very heavy. So, I went with a you know, these, you can get these graphite ones, you know, these graphite reels yeah. or carbon reels. And uh, my favorite reel that I've used, um, spinning wheel reel is a Pissy Fun Carbon X. And it's a 2000. It only weighs like five ounces. I mean, I can fish all day long with that thing and it yeah. does not hurt my wrist. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I know that's, to me, that's a big deal. Because nobody fishes with me because nobody wants to stay out 10 to 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I, I, the front seat of my boat is always empty because, <laughs> I mean, they're only good good for three or four hours. And I, 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 that's just not me. I go up there and I'm spending first in, last off. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, in order for you to, to cut down on fatigue, what's been your... your uh, I mean, you go to a bait caster, which is only four or five ounces for yeah. a bait caster, and that's great. But in spinning reels, have you found something that you like? Yeah. Well, the uh, I, I got a, a memory while you were talking about when I first got into salmon fishing. You know, we got to drive over to Medford, uh, Coal Rivers Dam, to or Coal Rivers Hatchery is where I cut my teeth on Chinook and Coho and. When I first started getting into it, I didn't know how to use a bait casting reel. So I <laughs> went and got me one of them big old spinning reels, threw some 30, 40 pound test on there and thought I was getting ready to go. And I think I was about an hour into it before I just, my wrist wasn't going to hold up anymore. Yep. And so again, you know, it's going to depend on what you're after and what your gear is. And if I'm fishing anything over 15 pound test i'm going to be throwing a, a bait caster um even if you don't have the terminal weight to make it behave correctly there's some ways around that i think we can talk a bit about that later anything anytime that i'm uh fishing with 15 pounds or lighter then i'm thinking about switching back and forth and probably more like eight or ten you know even um and of course when you're talking about bass, you can uh, use the braided line of high tensile strength with low diameter to kind of rip through the, the lily pads or whatever it may be, the aquatic growth of some sort. And that's always going to be better off on a 
bait casting type reel. Um, but again, it, it depends on which arm's tired, right? So <laughs> if you've been catching a bunch of fish on your spinning reel all morning, you know, like, hey, let's try something different, even get out the fly rod once in a while. <laughs> well, that's you, so. Do you do you like a certain size reel? I have spinning reel. I mean, do you? Yeah. Do you, most people buy three thousands because it's in the middle. Yeah, I, I I don't necessarily go by the numbers and stuff. Honestly, I I like it to have a lot of ball bearings. I like it to be really smooth. I like to be able to flip the the handle and have it turn, pick up line you know, with that hand being free for whatever other reason, um, that kind of my, my metrics aren't necessarily about necessarily, uh, size and design, but, you know, balance and functionality. It's nice to have a spare spool, you know, so you can switch over really easily if you want to go back and forth between mono and braid or something like that. Um, I got one rod these days that I just won't buy anything else. And, if I'll get that rod and, and uh, put the reel on, and if it bounces out right, that, that's the one for me. Yeah. No, I. it's always been durability and lightweight. I mean, that's that's kind of what – and then just making sure that the spool can hold enough line for me for I, – I, I mean, even 1,000s, you know, can hold 100 yards, you know, of, yeah. uh, of a small diameter line. So now that bait casters – I mean, I one thing about – when I go fishing, I'll put four or five rods on my boat, typically. <laughs> That's about what I use. And although I have more than that. And uh, the uh, my bait casters, um, how, what do I say? Uh, I, they're, they're really my go-to, my bait casters. What I use eight, nine times out of ten is my bait casters. But one thing a bait caster cannot do very well unless you spend four or five hundred dollars on the reel with a good braking system um is working in the wind and you know if you cast towards the wind a bait caster is going to backlash on you uh unless you're really good at thumb control so i always have a spinning reel you know spinning gear in my boat because i go to lake of the woods as you know it gets really windy there so unless I'm casting with the wind and not against it, I'm going. I'm going to pick up my spinning reel and uh, work that. Be, I mean, I'm pretty good at my bait casters, and I do have a four hundred and fifty dollar reel <laughs> that I absolutely that make love. A difference. It does the Shimano Aldebaran, which is I just respooled it um, with some um, some new line. We'll go into lines later, but the uh, uh, the Shimano Aldebaran is for a BFS and I like light tackle is the best. And, uh, I have this, I, you know, I, I had a, um, I just had this on a, this Abu Garcia max pro. I bought it on a lot, you know, um, auction and I had it. And so I got my new rod and I put this, this max pro on it. I am shocked for an $80 reel. This bait caster is so good. I, I mean, I'm a Shimano guy, but and I learned bait casting on an Abu, but this Abu Garcia Max Pro, I could throw it out there and it, the bait will hit the water and it won't backlash without a thumb. You can literally go thumbs free on this reel. And I am astounded. <laughs> That an eighty dollar bait caster can do that. Uh, what, what kind of bait casters do you use? Well, welcome back to Terrible at Fishing. We got so much more to talk about when it comes to reels. So let's listen. I I like the Abu Garcias too. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm looking for a a middle of the line, high functioning, cheap as possible type of a a real you know i'd have to go look at my my rod rack to tell you what i got out there but i i'm not really uh beholding to any manufacturer per se rather just pick it up you know see how it feels put it on a, a rod that uh, is analogous to the one you're going to use check for balance and then uh you know i like the magnetic uh break on there if it has a 
a friction back uh, break and then a magnetic break, then that will help with the backlash as well. And then, you know, as long as we're talking about backlash, I got to bring up my, my mentor, Bill Dance, right? So he, <laughs> I love he has a trick. If you, if you get a backlash on your bait caster, you need to sock your drag down all the way as tight as you can get it and then put your thumb on top of the uh, spool while you reel in. Push down as hard as you can and reel about three or four turns. Then click your bail and pull out until you get to a stop again and do it again. And if you're putting as much pressure with your thumb on there, with your, you, you got to use both hands to turn the spring. If you do that three or four times, I, I've been amazed some of the backlashes I've been able to get out of my reel and save from having to cut out wasted line, wasted time for fishing, re-spooling. Uh, that, that old Bill Dance trick really works. So takes a lot of the angst out of bait cast fishing too. Yeah. Well, it does. I hate when manufacturers say our reel has no more backlashes. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. I mean, that's an out and out lie. Because even my my BFS, my Shimano uh, Aldebaran, which is the finest BFS reel that you money can buy, I backlash. <laughs> okay. Either I'm that bad, <laughs> but they don't claim it that way. And so I've seen that over and over and over again. And it's like, please, nobody believe that. If you don't know how to operate, you want to learn how to operate a uh, a baitcaster. I have a really good tutorial on my Terrible at Fishing YouTube channel. Really good tutorial. It'll teach you what the tension knob does, what the brakes do, what are good brakes, different brakes. You know, my uh, Shimano SLX XT has both, like you mentioned. It's got magnetic and it's got centrifugal. And when you combine the two, it really does help a lot. So um, that's kind of, you know, you just got to learn. It's practice, practice, practice on these things. But once you do, it's the only one thing about a bait caster, you can adjust the drag while you're reeling in. You can't do that with a spinning reel. A spinning reel, it's up front, your drag. <laughs> and so you can't, you have to literally stop your reel, tighten your drag, and continue reeling in. And at that point, you could lose the fish because a fish can create slack at that point and spit out the hook. So I like that about bait casters is adjusting the drag on the fly. So what what, this what uh, Pro Max, Abu Pro Max is uh, my, my most recent. And I, I thought I'd bring up the low profile versus yep. kind of more round. I, I don't know the name. Yeah. So these, these lower profile reels are more about bass and flipping from a boat for warm water fish versus, you know, going after the salmon with the, with the larger round reel, um, they also, they work a lot the same. But these these are you know they're they're made to be able to be held better than, than with those those round ones. Well, it's easier too to pull out a backlash <laughs> than a round reel. A round reel, which you know I was really the Calcutta by Shimano was another one that's really a good one. It was about the same price as the Aldebaran. I wanted to go with something I could palm, which is what you were mentioning. But also, if I did get a backlash, which you're going to, everybody does. All pros get a backlash. Once in a while, it's going to happen. And you can just pick it out better um, with a low profile reel. So it's just, it's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> it's just the way it's going to be. But I love, you're right. I mean, you have, that one's called a Pro Max. Because yes, this is called a Max Pro. Max, Max this, Pro, oh. I got it backwards. You're right. Okay, no, good. That's right there, Pro Max. Oh, well, I, I'm amazed by this. And the neat thing, too, about um, this is that it's got a little pin that you pull out. And that that releases your um, your side cover. And I love that about this. And but and so it just releases the side cover by just pulling out the pin. Um, I don't have to deal with a little switch. So I like that. I mean, it's a good, I barely, I probably have the brakes on 25% on the, these magnets. 
and yeah. this Abu Garcia Max Pro or or Pro Max or whatever, mine's, mine says Max Pro. I, 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 and you'll hear me talk about it on my YouTube channel. I'm just amazed by it. If I, I, I would buy another one of these. I mean, I just got this on a lot auction. <laughs> <laughs> it was brand new and it was in the lot. And I go, well, I'll, I'll see what it's like. And I like it. <laughs> so, so you, you uh, need to think about uh, adjusting the break and drag for each lure you put on. Yes. So the, 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 uh, the suggestion is to, to open the bail or whatever you call it on a bait casting. I'm sorry to, yeah. to, to click it in the free spool right. and then cool. let the weight, let the weight of the lure dr uh, drag line off the reel, just holding it out in front of you and then adjust the brake so that that line is coming off steadily, but pretty slowly. Very slow. Yeah. And once that lure is dropping down at a pretty slow rate, then you can, that, that's where your brake belongs. If you put a heavier, lighter lure on, then you need to do that again and adjust your brake appropriately. Yep. No, it's, I mean, again, that's part of what I, you know, teach on that video. And it's interesting you know, as you cast the tension knob, which is what you were just talking about, the tension knob has, if you get a backlash right after you, re you release it and you start and it, and it goes off and you, you know, just blows up on you, that's your tension knob. And then at the arc, when it starts to slow down, that's your break. Yes, so where you get your backlash has a lot to do where you didn't do it right. So I always tell people, set your brakes to max. And set and and do what you just mentioned about letting that bait goes down slow and learn how to cast. You're not going to cast far. <laughs> it's just not breaks on max. It's just only going to go about thirty feet. Um, but as you get the feel for it with your thumb, just riding that spool because your thumb is the most important break, and then start loosening the brakes and the tension until you get really good at it. And you can cast a mile. You know, I, again, I am shocked how good this abu is because I'm casting one, one and a half ounce lures with this on my heavy. And I just, with the flick of my wrist, and we'll talk about rods in a second, this thing is just sailing <laughs> on me. And it, when it hits the water, no backlash. I don't have to worry about it because a lot of times when I was learning, I watch my lure and right, before, right when it hits the water, I, I, I stop the spool you know, with my thumb. And that helped me a lot to not have that blow up. So well, that, you know, that ounce and a half weight makes a big difference too. If you're fixing lighter, <laughs> yeah, lighter lures, you just, there's a point where you just can't cast it with bait or with bait caster anymore. Yeah. Unless you buy an Aldebaran or something, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, even I, then, I you have, know, a crappie jig, you know, a 16,000 jig is just not going to pull line off of any bait caster. Oh, so, no, no, no. My Aldebaran. Is that right? I, okay. I, I can cast a five gram bait on my Aldebaran. Wow. Five grams. That's like one sixty fourth of an ounce. <laughs> and it is, that's why I got it, was BFS, Bait Finesse Systems, are, uh, it's, it's well, it's hard to find a good, you know, my first one was a, oh, it was a Cast King, which I hated. Um, but uh, then I went to the Curado BFS and it did pretty good at about one eighth of an ounce. But then I went to the Aldebaran, which I could cast any length or any light bait up to five grams or down to five grams. I mean, it's just an, a, that is a magic reel. And I threw it out there and it hit the water and no backlash, thumb, thumbless. I mean, it's worth 450 bucks. But I had to sell a lot of baits to, to afford a $450 reel. It's, a, it's expensive. I know. I know. But I treated myself. <laughs> another another good way to avoid backlash is to always be checking those knots because you go breaking off one, oh, of, my goodness. one of those ounce, ounce lures right at the cast. It'll it'll backlash you like nobody's business. Yeah. No. And I, Yeah, you're right. I mean, and then, yeah. 
<laughs> That's just funny. always check your knots. I'll, I'll bring that up every time we talk. Check those I, knots, folks. <laughs> I, I do. I do. A, I, I I tie what's called a, a paranoid palomar. You know, I like palomar knots, but I always put a couple square knots on top of it. <laughs> That's my paranoid palom. I am not losing anything because of a knot. I mean, it's just not. I, I, it's just one of my things too. So, but you'll be surprised. In really, really light line, like four pound line, it can get abrasion so quickly. Yeah. And even though I use really good line, um, abrasions will happen a lot easier on four pound tests or six pound tests. And, and that makes it brittle. And so you can cast it and your line will break. Yep. And um, you got to, that's where the extra spool and BFS has a very small spool, very shallow. And so you can only put maybe 80 to 100 yards, depending on your diameter. All right. Well, that covers reels really good. All right. Rods. We, we, we're just talking all sorts of stuff about reels because we can go on about that. I'm going to talk about rods. <laughs> what is our favorite rods? What's your favorite <laughs> rod, Ken? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I'm going to be kind of boring on this segment because... No way. These, uh, these ugly stick carbons. Oh, good. The, the red, the new red ugly sticks, you cannot beat them. They got the same uh, resilience and, you know, they'll stand up to just about anything the way ugly sticks always have. But they've introduced some feel, a really uh, stiff backbone down at the butt, you know, so you get that that quicker action for, you know, larger fish and, and good casting and performance. and. You know, I've I have five of them now. I have uh, I have a a seven and a half bait caster that I can use with uh, like bobber doggin type style. Anything for the anadromous fish. I got this uh, seven footer that I use in my bass boat all the time, and then I got three spinning reels of very uh, spinning rods of various sizes uh, for everything from you know fishing in the lake for big trout down to uh, flicking tiny lures in the creek somewhere. Yeah. I, no, I don't ugly. fish with anything else except my fly rod now. Well, oh, really? Well, yep. the ugly stick, my son is a big ugly stick fan. So, I mean, it. ugly sticks are tough. They're durable. They do very, 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 very well. Extremely affordable for everybody to buy an ugly stick. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, me, I, as I learned more and more about rods, uh, and there's, there is a spine and it's something I didn't know about, about rods is that they have a spine on them, which is an area on the circumference of the, of the rod that allows it to bend and cast better and more accurately. One thing about Chinese rods, they don't pay attention to spines. They just make a rod. And, um, a lot of times a rod manufacturer, if they're handmade, they will bend the rod and they'll find the spine. And on a spinning rod, the, the guides are lined up on the spine. On a bait casting rod, it's on the exact 180, on the opposite side. And so you're able to get a more accurate and farther cast um, with a properly lined up um, rod. So even though, so I buy an American made rod and it's handmade. <laughs> so I know. I know, but it's actually a fairly affordable brand. I mean, um, Cajun uh, rods, uh, yeah, 120 bucks on up for one of their rods. I mean, that's not a, an ugly stick. I mean, that's for sure, but they stand behind it. And I and I told you before we started the show, I actually broke one of mine uh, this last week and snapped the tip off. And um, I'm repairing it, but they're sending me another rod. They have lifetime warranties. So... As much as I love my Cajun, I, oh, it really hurts when I break one. Well, welcome back to Terrible at Fishing. We got so much more to talk about. <laughs> so it just really hurt me because it was my only heavy and I didn't put my medium heavy in my boat. And so I was, so I was relegated to eliminate all my bigger tackle. So, and that's something else too. People don't know that a rod just above the, the, the grips, it has a bunch of information on it. And that information is going to tell you what you can throw with it, what you can put on it. 
And people, you know, if I threw an ounce and a half bait with my, my Aldebaran, not a good idea. Not a good idea. I would break that rod and I'd over, I would overload the reel. It's just not designed for it. So when we buy what we want, you know, we get something on sale, make sure that it's something you'll be using. So, I mean, if I was to do a, a an all around reel, a rod, just one rod, it would be a medium or a medium heavy right in there. So I would, one of those two, and I'm a big seven footer. I like seven foot rods. So almost yep. all my rods are seven foot because they have more of a kick to them for casting. If I go with a short rod, I have too much backbone, which is the stiff portion of the rod. And I don't get as much, I don't know, what do you call it? Yeah, I call it flip. Action. Whip. Action. Thank you very yeah, so much. You, one, one of the things you're leaving out about those <laughs> metrics on rods is, is the action, fast yep. versus slow, and then medium. So that refers to the rate at which it bends towards the butt. So a very slow action rod is going to bend more evenly throughout the length of the rod right. versus a fast action, which bends a lot more at the tip and none at the butt. So right. I like a, a, more, a faster action rod. I, I don't like the feel of a, of a slow action rod that bends down into underneath your hand. It does have its place with a big hard fighting fish where you're trying to take as much of that uh, head throb away from the line as possible and absorb it into the rod. Um, but nothing, you know, a, a medium action would be fine in that circumstance. The fast action comes in handy for casting long distances, heavy lures, and then, you know, uh, surf fishing or, or in the, in the current where you're, you're dealing with more than just the fish. Uh, but a faster action, it's just easier to control and has a better feel, I think. Yeah, you're right. And, and actually, for freshwater, I don't think you can find too many slow rods in, in for, for freshwater fishing. Uh, most, of, most of them are going to be moderate, fast, moderate, or, or, or fast action, or even extremely fast. But that's all backbone. You know, extreme fast is a very, very stiff rod. And I do have one. I do my my medium heavy is an extremely fast uh, action, and it's very hard to cast. I mean, when if you bought a, a very very fast rod, it you're basically you're the you're the whip, <laughs> your arms the whip. <laughs> so you want it you want something that's moderate or or just fast, and uh, in order for you to just not tire yourself out all day long. So you're right, you're right. I, I love that. And ugly sticks are—I mean, they just last forever. <laughs> when you uh, when you do some creek or river fishing, getting it out of the bushes is really tough with a slow <laughs> rod, too. You're right. You're right. Yeah. No. Yep. And, and when it comes, but I if what would you would what would you suggest for a one rod person? I mean, ugly stick, which will last forever. Yeah. But what's but I, um, so let, a meat? Let me throw the 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 ugly stick carbon. So it, I gave up on ugly sticks a long time ago because of feel they're great for slamming in the car door, but you know, they don't, <laughs> they don't have a lot of feel to them, you know? Yeah. And so that's, it's the carbon, the, these red ones, the red ugly stick. And it, that's it. I mean that with a good reel, you know, so and medium, a thick, medium heavy. Yeah. They, they come, I think they're all about the same action from what I can really? tell. I, I don't see any different actions and they are at that medium fast, uh, okay. kind of just a, a bit towards quick for medium and they come in all sizes, all different uh, orientations as far as bait, bait caster or spinner reel. And if I had to choose one, you know, it'd be my six, six and a half foot ugly stick carbon with a, a pretty decent size, you know, 1500 size reel pulled with eight pound test. And I've caught salmon on rods like that. That's a great you know? setup. Mm -hmm. so that's a great setup. I mean, you can catch, you can fish all day long with that setup. Yes, so no, it's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, I own six triggers from a <laughs> Cajun and you know, it's a, they're light, medium light. Um, and uh, I, I just, I, I, you know, for a trout fisherman, they want lighter stuff. A trout fisherman typically likes lighter stuff. And me, I'm a bass fisherman. I just want to, if I hook a quarter pounder, you know, bass, 
I just want it to feel like a one pounder. So, <laughs> I mean, I know it's a little fooling me, but I lighter tackle makes smaller things feel bigger. And that just makes it more fun for the day. So that's just me. I mean, I like it. Yes, All right. <laughs> All right. We've talked about reels. We've talked about rods. <laughs> now, in our last show, <clears throat> Ken, you talked about something at Parker's. I didn't know what you were talking about. I need you to tell me about this thing that you were talking about at Parker's. And I love going to Parker's. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a great shop. It's about the only good fishing shop we got. And uh, to be honest, I, I, uh, I'm very disappointed for all the fishing spots we have around here in, in um, Klamath Falls. I mean, basically, it's by, by Mart and Parker's. <laughs> Those are my, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, Sportsman's yeah. Warehouse, they got nobody there that knows anything about fishing. They're all hunters. So what were you talking about last time at Parker's? Well, I mean, Parker, since, since, you know, uh, Mr. Parker passed a number of years ago now, but he lived on the Williamson River and he'd been designing these lures for Red Band Rainbows for his life, or is what I know. And he was, he was a great mentor. He had a lot of pointers for anybody who stopped in and he made his own lure. So, you know, he make he made spinners. They still make them, though not at the same level. They're not as available as they used to be. But uh, I got into spoon fishing uh, because of Mr. Parker. And you know what I was talking about is is the swivel that was on there. And so you know, there's always this debate uh, tying directly to the lure versus using a snap swivel. And uh, basically, what we're talking about here is maintaining the barrel swivel but using a split ring instead of a snap. And that just reduces the profile of, of that intermediate tackle. So, you know, big fish don't get that way by being stupid. So the less of a, uh, the more natural it looks, the less profile it has, the better chances you have of catching one of those lunkers. So I make lures, I buy uh, snap, I buy split rings and barrel swivels by the thousands and I keep them handy. Um, if I tie on a lure that doesn't have a, a ring on it, uh, I put the snap ring and the barrel swivel on there. If it already has the snap ring, which it, in some cases they do that with Rapalas and others, don't tie directly to the, to the split ring that comes with a number of issues, right? Just uh, slides around can come off, can, can braid your knot where the split ring comes together. So, uh, put a little barrel swivel on there and then tie to that. You get the freedom of a, a loop knot or a, a split ring, you know, attachment without the risks that come with those. So at the end of your, your, I mean, you're adding a barrel swivel to all your lures is basically what you're doing. A barrel yeah. swivel and the split ring. So sometimes right. they come with a split ring, like uh, the the pixies, or sometimes now the like rattle traps and others. They'll they'll have the split ring on there, but not the swivel. If you tie directly right. that split ring, you're 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 taking some risk in that. It it can just slide right out. Your knot gets inside that that split ring and comes right out, or it gets it gets uh, braided by the end of the split ring or something like that. And that barrel swivel doesn't, you know, they, they, I buy them in black. And so right. they're, they're less visible and just has all kinds of value when it comes down to it. I, I don't, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it, Thomas Buoyant spoons are my favorite lure on the market. They catch everything out there and they make all kinds of colors. They're about seven bucks each these days. So, uh, they come with the split ring attached in some cases, um, uh, yeah, but if you're if they don't if you don't have that split ring on there you're tying directly to the body of the bait you're losing some action and there's a little hard edge there on that where they drill the hole through the lure even if it's painted it's still got a little bit of a hard edge and that's another risk you're taking for losing that big one so uh, you know you, if you just have those barrel swivels in a sw split ring another thing is you know you get that on there you tie that on you you decide you want a different color you don't have to untie the barrel swivel. You just work the lure through the split ring, work the new lure back through the split thinking. ring. 
Yep, a little bit quicker <laughs> reach high as well. So if you, you actually just add a, a barrel swivel at the end of your line, you could if and you have split ring pliers. Always have split ring pliers, by the way. <laughs> it just saves you. So, it's so easy, and uh, you could just attach this to the split ring that is on your lure, and Perfect. this way you're not tying anything. You basically tied it once, unless you've got some damage to your line, and then of course you're going to cut that off and and retie on your barrel swivel. So instead of having a barrel swivel on all your lures, you can just have it at the end of your line. And then with a split ring plier, just reattach it to any of one of your um, lures that you want. That's, That's clever. Right. Yep, See, I, I, I knew you I, had a good idea in the last show. I just didn't know. I didn't get it. <laughs> when, when I when I get my bot my tackle box ready for for tomorrow morning, I'll make sure there's a handful of barrel swivels and split rings already connected to each other in yep. there and. You know, I, I get to robbing other lures I've made when I don't have them handy, and I then I got to re redo what I've already done. So I make sure I got extra so I don't go cannibalizing other lures. A lot of people, they don't see the value of, in, in fact, even for myself, uh, growing up, a barrel swivel. I mean, we just didn't see the value of it. We saw we saw the um, the, the quick snaps, you know, that's nice. And I only, if I use them, I use only the ones with the interlocking bend to them mm. and really good gauge. Um, so Spro actually makes some pretty good um, quick snaps. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, a barrel swivel, sometimes I use that to add a leader. Yep. Um, and if I'm doing that, you know, I'll go ahead and like, like I was telling you last time, uh, uh, a bubble bobber, filling it with water, putting it on my line, putting a barrel swivel and three to five foot leader. Um, and that, that allows me to catch 150 or whatever, uh, endless amount of trout. Um, and this time of year, you got to go deep. <laughs> I was on the lake. Uh, last time I was on the lake, uh, I think it was Friday, 75 degree surface temp, 75. You're not going to catch. A uh, uh, cold water fish, you, you know, shallow at 75 <laughs> degrees. In fact, they'll be floaters. Yes, so sir. I was 75, man. Everybody so that, was swimming. That, uh, that, that snap swivel is just too much tackle. I, I find so? very few reasons that I need a snap swivel when I can uh, accomplish the same thing with a barrel swivel and a, a split ring. And, you know, I think we'd be missing the point if we didn't talk about line twist, right? That's the real, the real issue here, and especially when you're trolling. But anytime that you're uh, retrieving quickly, you're going to end up with line twist. And if you're talking about an inline lure like a Panther Martin or something, right. you know, that what they'll say is bend that bend the loop over at a 90 degree angle to avoid line twist. But now you're hindering your action. Right, you're not, you're not the 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 lure is not spinning like it would if you weren't worried about that. So a good, I mean, even a a, a bearing swivel. If you're trolling uh, and you want to do anything over a mile or two per hour, you should really be thinking about line twist. And the only way to deal with that is some sort of swivel. Yeah, I I really well I troll very slow, <laughs> so. If I go, I actually, I try to stay at about one mile an hour uh, when I'm trolling, if I troll. So it's, it all depends, too, on the bait that I'm using. Uh, so if you're doing an inline, and I do make my own inlines, my own inline spinners. And, uh, I mean, you can make an inline spinner. And you talked about Jen's craft last time. That's where I got my, um, my, uh, my little doohickey to make inline spinners. Yeah, it's cheap, 30 bucks. And then it costs a dollar to make an inline spinner. From then on out, welcome back to Terrible Wet Fishing. We got so much more to talk about. I, I, I just can't spend five or six, seven bucks for an inline spinner that I'll probably snag and lose. <laughs> um, it's just probably what's going to happen. And I can make my own colors. I can make my own yeah. designs. I could do whatever, different hook sizes, stuff like that. Single hooks. You know, when you're on the Williamson's, because you can't use a treble on the Williamson's, you got to use a single hook. You can still use a barb, okay. but uh, you got to use a single hook. 
So I'm, I have a box just for the Williamsons. And it's a great, I love, I love river fishing. I mean, that's just, I mean, you love li river. You like fly fishing though. And I did that once in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> and my boss got mad at me because I kept hitting rocks on the cast <laughs> and I was losing flies that he tied. So he just kept getting mad at me. So I, 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 I Maybe one day I'll pick up fly fishing again. I don't know. I, I, it was a lot of fun, but I like to fly fish, but I'm not above uh, putting a worm on there either. So, oh really? Get them diehards out there, and they see you with the worm canister and a fly rod. You're really a uh, oh, really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 you know, I, I fly fishing looks. Well, it wasn't bad. It wasn't fun. I mean, we were still head fishing on the Yuba and, uh, um, and, uh, it was fun. It was, and we floated it for miles and, uh, my car, one side, one, his car on the upside. And, you know, when you float, you just got to have two cars or a shuttle service. And around here, we don't have a shuttle service, you know, on the road they do, but over here, there's nobody that you could pay to pick up your truck and drop it off at, your other, you know, at your out, you know, at your out ramp. So I need a shuttle service locally. That's a pretty good service. You're just driving somebody else's car, which is pretty good. All right. Oh, line, fishing line. You mentioned earlier, and I know this problem is common with fluorocarbon. It has a high memory, um, especially in bigger gauges, uh, bigger tests. So um, you don't like fluorocarbon on spinning reels. That's a big test because neither do I. I mean, you try to get a 20-pound fluorocarbon to stay on a spool, it's a pain in the rear. I tried heating it up in water, hot water, and then uh, spooling it and trying to create a new memory to it. That didn't work. <laughs> do you have it? I mean, fluorocarbon is my favorite line because it's completely invisible in the water. It has the same refraction as water. So in the water, fluoro is invisible and it has very low stretch and good knot retention. But there's there's a limit to fluorocarbon, as I found out, because of the uh, high memory of it. Um, so there's mono, uh, which is stretchy. <laughs> wait, wait, and when it comes to a clear line, what do you like? I, I like the fluorocarbon coated. So ah. it, it's hard. I don't know why, uh, but Big Five carries this platinum line on really big spools, 2,500 yards. It's called platinum. And they, I don't know why they won't seem to stock it in a poundage, you know, pound test that is useful for around here. So it's almost always too heavy like 12 and up, but when they do have eight or 10 pound tests, I'll buy a couple of reels uh, uh, spools of that uh, hybrid um, a platinum from big five. And, you know, I don't, for me, whether it's fluorocarbon, fluorocarbon coated or mono, you've got to get it on the reel, right? And so with a bait casting rod, what you want to do is let the reel, let the spool spin but that's not what you want to do with a with a spinning rod you want it to come off vertically and yeah. it, it, it matters which way it went on so you exactly. it, it it would be easier to to spool up your spinning rod with you know with the uh spool face up because always the the indentions where you you put it for safekeeping on the bottom of the new spool you bought right. is, is on the bottom but almost always, for some reason, they spool it on there backwards, and you got to have the, the the new spool upside down, which then causes problems because there's all those indentions on the bottom that goes running off across the room. So yep. you do not want to spool a spinning rod with that spool spinning. You're introducing yeah, you you're introducing twist when you do that. Um, and it's a mess. That, it's such yeah. a mess. Yeah, and the, you want you want to you almost always from the bottom up. Make sure that's sitting still, and it, but then check it, reel a few times, and open your bail. If those loops start jumping off, 
you got it coming off the reel, off the new wrong. spool the wrong way. Yeah. And then I always, once I'm done spooling up, I go out in the driveway or down the block, depending on how much line I got on there. And I, I tie it off to something or hook the hook in the stop light, stop sign or something like that. Walk down the block, get all that line out and pull it tight and stretch it. Monofilament or, uh, or hybrid or fluorocarbon. If you stretch it out and then reel it on tight, that's how you put new memory in it. Got to right. stretch your line every time. Yeah, I've 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 looked at all sorts of uh, tricks and stuff like that. And then with fluorocarbon, even though I love I, I fish with fluoro, and I use a P line tactical for the most part, or the fluoro clear, which is a hybrid, um, like what you're mentioning. The uh, but the P line tactical is expensive, <laughs> but boy, it's really good. And you got to make sure that whoever, if you have somebody at the tackle shop, spool it like you uh, or you know you were saying they got to be doing it properly and do not fill up your spool a lot of people they'll just fill it up till there's no lip on it so you need at least an eighth of an inch or a little greater on that lip or else it'll just it'll fall off of it so yep. you got to make sure that you don't fill your spool up to the total rim you got to give yourself a gap and right. people don't people are not I had a buddy that was with, went fishing. He bought all the great stuff, everything I told him to buy. <laughs> and then he had the guy at the tackle shop put spool, spool is up and it went on wrong and he filled it up to the, the lip because yep. you're buying it by the foot. So of course he's putting as much as he can on and because that's his job. You got to give yourself that gap up on the top on, on that spool. Got to give it to you. Uh, oh, Poor guy. So if, you, if you do I find kept yourself, it off. <laughs> yeah. If you if you do find yourself in a situation where uh, you know you got a bunch of twist in your line or it's jumping off the spool yeah. like that, one thing you can do if you're in a boat or on a river is take your lure off and let all the line go out behind the boat or down the river, yeah. and let it let it just float in the current or or with the boat moving behind you for a little bit. That'll That'll, uh, first of all, let all the twist out pretty quickly, especially if you're going pretty quick or there's quick current. But then as you reel it back in, because there's no weight at the end, it is uh, laying on the way it wants to lay on. Yeah. Um, and uh, the memory in the line will help it lay on your spool the way it wants to. So then it will come off and go on easier. If you're having trouble with your line, let that's a good Let idea. I'll float down river without a lure on it and then reel it back in. That'll make a world of difference for your how your line's behaving on your spool. That's a great idea. Great idea. Well, this is where we probably disagree a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> because he likes Ken, you like spoons. I've never used spoons a lot. Even though I have some. <laughs> but if you were to pick, I don't know. One tackle box <laughs> to go out and fish with. What would it be? Uh, I do that every time I go fishing. I, I don't take a bunch of boxes with me. No way. I, yeah, I, I take what can fit in my oh, pocket. We got like or 10. a couple of extra things if I'm in my boat. Um, I, I have dozens of tackle boxes out there. Most yeah. of them that don't, never see the light of day. Who knows what's in those old things? So, you know, I got a couple of nice little boxes that get a lot of use. Stuff gets moved in and moved out. I can move the dividers around depending on what I'm taking. Uh, but rarely do I take more than 20 or 30 lures. And at least half of those are spoons of some sort. Different sizes, different colors. You know, of course, the uh, I don't I don't take like things like rooster tails or anything with me anymore. Really? I'll have a an inline spinner or two for the tough bite. I like I like small spoons. They work really well for for uh, trick fishing and and jigging and things like that. And then a couple of uh, like we talked last week, the wide set or the wide gap offset hooks for for uh, weedless rubber, you know, bait presentation like a Cinco. 
I mean, why, why do you need anything more? It's what works. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I need, I need to, I, maybe I need to use spoons more <laughs> because I don't, I don't use spoons. Um, it's all about I, the action that you can impart, right? We talked about that last week yep. with a, with a spinning reel, with a spin, with an inline spinner or something. It's really the action of the lure. Yes, with it a is. spoon, it's what you're doing with it. So when you're when you pop it, reel it quick, and then let it fall, they almost always bite it on the fall. And you it's know, it, you gotta be a more skillful angler to catch fifth fish with a spoon. Uh, but once you do get that imparting the action figured out, there's no better lure, my opinion. <laughs> I knew we disagree. <laughs> so I in my tackle box. Um, which I guess it would depend on which tackle box because I do go out with a lot of tackle boxes. But where I want to sort of narrow it down, I think an inline spinner is very important for a lot of people because it's so versatile and it's so easy to work. And you're right. I Last week I talked about sort of like my sawtooth retrieve where I'll, I'll, I'll let it drop and I'll let it sink and then I'll pull it in a little bit and let it sink again, pull it in, let it sink. And usually you're right on a drop. That's great um, to use. So, I mean, I need to put a spoon or two in, um, like a cast master or something like that. I don't know. Uh, you what, And you mentioned a, a type of spoon. What was that brand? Thomas Boyant. Thomas Boyant. I always like to have small jigs and uh, because I love pan fishing. I mean, I, I, I enjoy catching those crappie like crazy. So... I always put some crappie jigs in there and um, some very small finesse plastics that and, and put those on there and just throw it out there. And I usually go with either a green, you know, a chartreuse or a red. Depending on the lake I'm in, they like to hit either one more than the other. Um, so I kind of like going with those. And then, of course, being a bass fisherman, this time of year, I go to my topwater stuff. Because I just love the show. <laughs> so, I mean, when I was fishing Friday, I was going with a lot of different top waters, and my popper first was working, and then it didn't work anymore. So I tried my walking baits, I tried all sorts of things. But to be honest, the whopper plopper was the winner yet on <laughs> Friday. I know it's a fun bait to say that you got it's a whopper plopper, but a whopper plopper is basically a, a top water bait with a propeller on the back and it just motor boats are long. And when I started throwing my whopper ploppers, I started getting hits every other cast. I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom. And I love bass fishing this time of year, July and August, my favorite time of the months uh, months to uh, fish. 75 degrees just means that those bass are going to be breaking surface on you. So a whopper plopper is got to be a mainstay for this time of year for me. Um, and of course I like lily pad fishing. So my toad thumper frogs are getting their use. And a toad thumper is a brand of frog and it's really hard to catch fish on hollow bodies because a lot of people don't know that when you get the blow up, you can't set the hook. You got to wait. I tell people, take a deep breath, then set the hook. Um, the toad thumper has a molded in hole, hook into their, their hollow bodies with a, is a really good density. And if you're going to catch a topwater on lily pads, my toad thumpers are the best hookup ratio I've got. And I'd like to thank all of you for, the, for tuning in for this week's show, making us the number one show at goldcountryradio.org. So thank you and look forward to my fishing reports and next week's show at this time on Gold Country Radio. Thank you and tight lines to everyone.